Hello and welcome to the Applications for Future Social Conformance Solutions webcast. My name is John McHale, Group Editorial Director with Military Embedded Systems, and moderator for today's event. To learn more about Military Embedded Systems, please visit militaryembedded.com and check out our articles, blogs, and podcasts on military technology. Just a quick note on the title of today's webcast. We call it Applications for Future Social Conformance Solutions because the social conformance process has not yet been set up, but it's still possible to be aligned to the social technical standard, and we're going to speculate on what those applications will look like and have to be able to do going forward. And that's what our experts are here for. And speaking of those experts, our speakers today are Duke Wee Tran, Vice President of Global Marketing with AI Tech, and Dominic Perez, Chief Technical Officer to, with Curtis Wright Defense Solutions, joining the company in 2020 when they acquired Packstar. This webcast is sponsored by AI Tech and Curtis Wright Defense Solutions, and the event is hosted by Military Embedded Systems Online and Open Systems Media. Now, before we get started, I have some short housekeeping items to share with you. This and all Open Systems Media webcasts are copyrighted and may not be recorded or used in any way without the express written consent of Open Systems Media. This session will consume about 40 to 45 minutes, leaving the remaining time for the question and answer session. You'll find on your console window an area where you can enter your questions in real time. If you have a question pertaining to the event operation itself, one of our technicians will get back to you during the webcast. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the webcast while the question is still fresh in your mind. Then we'll address as many questions as we can during the closing Q&A portion. If you have a question for a specific speaker, please note so at the beginning of your question, or I'll offer the question to both of our speakers. Please note that as much as we'd like to, we may not get to all of your questions that day. In that case, some may get back to you after the webcast with more information. On the console, there's a handout section. That's where you can find the slides being presented today. This webcast will be archived online. The URL shown on your screen will be available within 48 hours. Once up, it'll be available for one year. Now it's time to get started. So I'm going to turn it over to Duke Wee Tran of AI Tech to get us going. Duke? Hi. Thank you, John. Thank you for the introduction. And Welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining our session uh, today. Um, I'm going to spend the next uh, 15, uh, 20 minutes talking about accelerated innovation for the social systems. And I'm going to cover a few different topics. Okay. So I'm going to remind uh, everyone a little bit why SOSA uh, military cross-platform, why it's something that everyone uh, it's very beneficial to everyone. So we, I'm going to spend time talking about some of the benefits of SOSA and conformant uh, systems. Uh, also looking at the uh, the future of the battlefield and the very increasing ne computer needs. Then the then I'll be talking about the SOSA conformance. Uh, so the, how do we get there? The path towards towards it, and the planning for SOSA conformant in terms of product uh, development. And what do you need to think about when you you prepare for a conformant uh, process. And then I'll walk you through the uh, social conformant uh, certification process. Obviously, it's not something that we've already done because it's not the process that is finalized, uh, but this is something that you can still uh, prepare for. And then I'll close it out with uh, a social use case and what AI Tech is doing uh, in this space, okay? So just a recap on why SOSA to begin with, and I, I think we we are probably fairly familiar with it. The first thing is actually, um, if you want to have business with the DOD, you, you need to be SOSA compliant in the future. Um, so even that's not spelled out in here, that's the, that's the first reason why you need to have uh, SOSA. But there's some other fundamental reason as well that is very beneficial to the whole ecosystems. The first being a strengthening um, the whole ecosystem and interoperability between systems. And this is one of the key pillars of uh, SOSA, which is making sure that the systems from uh, different vendors um, can work with uh, each other. Uh, this is quite fundamental as the defense systems are ever changing and the changing is, uh, is happening rather uh, accelerated as well. And it's something that can deploy in multiple platforms across land, across air, sea. And actually what's not here is actually um, something that uh, could be end up in space, even though it's not going to requirement, but uh, the space technology is bringing uh, some of the um, other uh, technology into it. Streamline development and computing requirements. So it's also a, a way to, to make upgrade uh, technology easier and to keep up with uh, rapid technology advancements. We all know that technology uh, development, it's, it's only accelerating. Um, and SOSA allows you to keep up that acceleration. 
and also ultimately is to protect the investment that you already made. Uh, the system are fairly expensive, and they are in service for a fairly number, a uh, fairly long number of years. We're talking about decades in certain uh, systems. And so you you can upgrade the the performance. You can upgrade the the use case that will change over time uh, with it. Um, the third thing is uh, compatibility for flexible product development and technology selections. Um, this is back to the interoperability, which is allows us to build and design systems that will work together, so that companies can spend time, um, uh, the supply chain can spend time developing the uh, the product and the requirements, uh, less time on simple integrations. Um, and I say simple, but it's, it's that's the complicated part. Uh, and if you remove that complexity, you you can um, have much more flexibility in, in, uh, in the product. And you can change the use case of the product uh, over time as well, uh, which leads you to more seamless upgrade and uh, replacements. And by having a common platform, um, you, you can deliver many uh, different uh, applications. And this will lead to more cost efficient cost efficiency and a unify a network of uh, partners. This will also greatly simplify the, the, the global supply chain um, and also uh, availability of replacements and availability of uh, parts um, um, as well. So there's some real benefit to, uh, to having SOSA um, on, um, as, as part of it and irrespective of the fact that you actually need to have it. Okay. So what a, with all that, what are some of the uh, takeaway benefits? It's faster development times. I think if, if you take it all together, what used to take years, you can talk, you can imagine in a world where everything is a social conformant to be done in a matter of months as opposed to years because you don't spend time uh, uh, doing integration between systems um, uh, as much as you would today. And you can combine boards and components for uh, integration, so integrated solutions. It's also um, uh, more reliable once uh, once you you have these systems on. You have the system that is already pre-tested, uh, that are common uh, communication protocols between different systems and within the the same systems. So that will improve uh, reliability uh, as well, and this will lead to lower risk. Um, yeah, to, to, to go through the conformant testing, you would have to do the test uh, at the, uh, within the supplier itself. Then you have to be verified by the verification authority. Then you certify. So all of that, all of that is qualified, tested uh, ahead of time. And so that should reduce uh, interoperability issues. And uh, you can use it for many different uh, mission profiles. And of course, uh, if you save time, you lower risk and it's more reliable, you will ultimately lower the NRE costs of the systems. Um, you can decrease uh, <clears throat> maintenance costs. And um, uh, because of the, the, the SOSA nature of the system is, is uh, inherently modular, so it's also make for uh, upgradability and scalability uh, a lot easier. Let's look at uh, why this is so important as well. If, if you look at the uh, future of the battlefield, the ever increasing needs of a computer um, and what's happening in real, it's what's happening in real time now with the war in Ukraine is it's highlighting this even more. And, it, and that trend is even, it's accelerated. Um, you have uh, drones, for example, uh, um, inexpensive drone taking out very expensive uh, tanks. Um, and so the use of drones is accelerated. Uh, the use of unmanned vehicle is accelerated. There are military robotics. Um, it's something that uh, will be um, will be required as well. And smart soldier, and all of that needs to be coordinated and communicated. And a common thread through all of them is the fact that you're going to need high processing power. You're going to need uh, AI applications. You're going to need all all the things that. Uh, uh, to be able to uh, run or uh, run these systems, so that uh, uh, that, that uh, increasing computing needs is uh, it's only um, accelerating. I would say it's accelerating computer needs uh, into the future. Okay, so now we, that we uh, 
talk a bit about uh, uh, Sosa and why is it's so important. And how do we get there? Um, um, key open uh, standard objective, as I mentioned earlier, is the interoperability. And it's a build, it's build common hardware, which is Sosa, and software, which is FACE. Although we're not going to talk about the FACE today, but you're going to require to have common hardware and the software system to, to make sure that you can uh, make the system interoperable too. Um, and uh, all this is part of the MOSA directive and it's got a real benefits to the, the government programs, but it also benefits to the entire supply chain. So where we are today is uh, um, the SOSA has, has released the uh, technical standard edition 1.0. And so that's complete. And the next phase, which is still in draft uh, right now, um, which is approved SOSA conformance certification program. And that program uh, co comprises of four, uh, four steps. The first is to establish, define, process involved conforming testing and verification. Essentially, what, what module you, you, you need to conform to, what are the testing requirements, what documentations. Um, and they're going to lay, lay it out in, in, in details, and that's going to come out um, uh, in phase approach as well. Um, the reason why um, all these things are coming up in phase approach is that the, the SOSA standards is very broad. Um, and many things to define. So depending on uh, what are the needs of the supply chain, um, they will release it uh, in, in, in different priorities of the different uh, process. The, uh, then the second step is provide uh, available and test of SOSA test suite uh, for initial verification. So to get into the testing um, is for the supplier to test out the, the systems, to know what test suite to, to look for, and to uh, submit the test result to the verification uh, authority. Then the third step is establishing third party uh, independent verification authorities. Uh, so there'll be a multitude of uh, independent uh, uh, verification authorities that, uh, uh, that will be used to do the, the uh, verification uh, testing. And then the fourth step is they establish and maintaining a certification register. This is where once the, the uh, each product that is a conformant um, can go on this register and you can search for it and uh, you can have access to which product gets a SOSA conformance. So as I mentioned uh, just a bit earlier, uh, this is going to be a, a phase approach um, and we're going to expect that to the release of these things formally to be sometime uh, later this year. So this is um, an example of what one of the um, um, uh, SOSA, some of the SOSA module and SOSA infrastructure and the different uh, um, SOSA standard module that uh, that's out there. And so once you decide uh, what product you're building, um, you'll have to go and look at uh, the either SOSA module or SOSA infrastructure. And is it a hardware element? Is it a software element? And select uh, the appropriate uh, chapters within, within them to, to be, do the conformant uh, to. And what I have in circle here are what we're doing at the AI Tech, which is one of the products we're doing. It's a plug-in uh, cards and the power supply. And we, we have to select uh, which infra, SOSA infrastructure module that we want to, to use. Um, and one of the thing about these things is you have to conform to all, of, all the requirements within each uh, conformance set that you select. Um, so once you select one, you, you have to, to, to do them all. So you're either conformant or you're not. Um, you're not, um, you're not gonna be partially a conformant. Okay, so as far as uh, planning for uh, for product development uh, to plan for social conformance, so I greatly simplify this process here. Obviously, there are many uh, many steps, but the first thing is preparation, which is prepare the subset of social technical standards, um, the conformance set uh, relevant to the social aligned product uh, that's under development. In in our case, we're doing an I/O intensive SBC plugin cards. Uh, another one is a social system uh, manager module. 
And so you select which uh, SOSA technical uh, standard from the previous slide that I, I, I showed, and then you follow the process that, that that's laid out in there. The other thing that uh, to keep in mind is uh, you want to budget time and schedule for it. Um, it it's, uh, uh, this will add uh, some additional costs and additional uh, schedule to, uh, to your product development. So this is something that we make sure that we, we do it as well. Um, even though you, you can design for um, a SOSA aligned product, but you have to go to account for a SOSA conforming certification process as well. Um, and then the, the third portion is to obtain and use the appropriate SOSA test suite for internal product design verifications to detect and fix and conforming issues at an early stage. Um, by the time you send to the authorities to verify, you should be doing all the tests yourself already and fix all the issue. Um, you're going to want to debug that internally. Uh, you're not going to want to use the authorities to, uh, to debug it for you. So um, by the time you, you send it to them, it should be uh, all tested internally and everything. So these are some of the three steps that, uh, that we're doing right now with some of our product uh, de development. So, and let's touch a bit about the conformance uh, certification process. And as I mentioned earlier, it's still in, um, in a draft form. Uh, but it's, 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 it should remain more or less the, the same flow. So it's comprised of three major steps. So the preparation step, uh, which is done by the supplier, the verification step, which is by the verification authority, and the certification uh, step, which is done by certification uh, authority. So in, within the first steps, uh, which is uh, the supplier uh, needs to do, which is under first is to understand the SOSA uh, technical standard, uh, then and start understanding the conformance uh, program, and select the test, select and test the relevant product in house, and prepare all the documentation for verifications. So once we do all that, uh, we have two documents that we're going to submit to the verification authority, which is a conformance uh, statements and a verification uh, matrix. Um, essentially, is to say what the product is, what it does, uh, what are the tests that, uh, what is the uh, conformance test uh, set that is uh, that uh, we use, and also what are the tests that is a uh, conformance test that is uh, required. And we submit that to the verification authority, which is a third party um, uh, selected by uh, the Open Standard Group. And then they will do the verification testing. Uh, they will do it, not the, the, not the supplier. And if, if uh, everything is uh, okay, then they release a verification report. Now, if it's not okay, um, then they will give you a report and tell you what it is, what are the things that didn't work, and it's up to the supplier to fix that and resubmit. Uh, again, this is you either conformant or you're not, and so um, this is a step where you you may have to do some iteration if uh, if things uh, didn't go the way it was planned. And then the last step is verification. Uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, certification. Of, of it. So once you have the verification uh, report, you pass on the certification authorities, they review the document, they compare to what you test, what you say is accurate. Um, there are some uh, things to sign, documents to submit, uh, fees to, uh, to, to provide. Uh, once everything is done, then you get a certificate. And once you get the certificates, uh, it goes into uh, certification to so register, and you can add that um, now it goes into the database that now everyone can have look up and see uh, that your product is now a SOSA conformant. Um, and also, once you, you get the certificate, now you can claim your, your product to be SOSA conformant and you can use the trademark on your website, your collaterals, um, and everywhere. everywhere. Um, so that's, uh, that's the process of uh, uh, the conformant uh, SOSA pro process. Now let's look at a bit of um, uh, now that we know why SOSA and and uh, how to uh, get the conformance. Let's look at a simple example of uh, the the use case and the power of having a SOSA systems. So if you look at this um, this slide here, it's um, 
we have, uh, for example, a multi-purpose um, 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 systems here, where you have the SOSA uh, PSU, the SOSA SBC, uh, two SOSA SBC, and two SOSA GPGPU. And these are some of the product that uh, we are currently developing. You can imagine where you have a system with all these SOSA uh, um, boards to fit on the same uh, computer, and it has a standard slots. And uh, for example, you can have a use case for visual AI and object de detection in this case. If you want to change a use case from visual AI and object detection to radar applications, you don't have to redesign the whole system. All you have to do is swap the two blue uh, bar, the SOSA um, GP, GPU, for SOSA conformer processing uh, RF for processing board. By swapping two boards without having to redesign everything, you now have a radar application instead. And so you, you can see the, the power of this. And this is a very simplified uh, systems where you have a five module and you swap two of them, you have a different applications. If you swap another two system or you swap a bunch of other ones, you can create more applications. The other thing is because you have the same SOSA slot profile, you, you can also upgrade the systems uh, and uh, future-proof the system so that if you have a newer generation GP, GPU and it's SOSA conformant, you can also swap with the one that you have uh, and everything should be working. The main difference in, in, in simplistic terms, the main difference between SOSA Align, which I, this is what we can do today, to SOSA conforming is Align means that it should work, but SOSA conforming means that you know it will work. And, and so we want to get to a point where uh, every system is uh, gonna be SOSA conformant, so that you can swap things easily for upgrades or, or simply partner up with uh, a different vendor, which is the, uh, the other things, I mean. Uh, for example, in, in this case here, uh, we have the uh, SBC, the P PSU, and GP, GPU, but uh, at AI Tech, we do not have the uh, RF processing board. And so we can use a third party processing board and apply it in, and you have a whole different use case. So it opens up uh, a lot of options for the industry to do that, and you can see the, the, the power of it. And this is on my uh, last slide here. So just a, a bit of uh, AI tech, some of the things that we're doing. Uh, so we're investing in uh, SOSA systems. Uh, we're investing in uh, Intel and PowerBC board, uh, SBC that you see in uh, one of the top picture here. Uh, in uh, GPGPU AI graphic processing, this is uh, fairly high demand right now uh, that we have. And also we're investing in high uh, efficiency power supply. Um, and this is just a start of what we, uh, we're doing, and uh, we can have many more in the future. With that, thank you for listening. Hi, this is Dominic Perez. Uh, Duke, thanks for uh, setting the stage around SOSA alignment and uh, conformance. It's very, very interesting. Um, I wanted to take a look at some of the applications that these systems will be used for in, in the near future. Um, after all, we're not building systems just to conform with SOSA. We have to look at the end user applications and what our warfighters are going to demand from these systems moving forward. Uh, we know that systems that are today built around VPX um, as they evolve or be, you know, refresh in the future, those will become SOSA aligned or SOSA conformant. Uh, but let's look at what else we can do. Now, we're, where we're sitting today is really the intersection of the MOSA directive, where SOSA kind of flows down from, and the Joint All Domain Command and Control, or JADC2, initiative. JADC2 is one of the most ambitious programs the DOD has ever undertaken. And it's going to take years to achieve this vision with a combination of currently available technology and new technology to fill the gaps. I'm not gonna rehash all of JADC2, but in a nutshell, the DOD is attempting to break down the barriers of communication and situational understanding. Today's warfighter can't be impaired by a lack of information and we need to tear down the walls that we've built 
between those domains of land, sea, air, and as Duke said, space, but also cyber. All of our armed forces and coalition partners need to be able to share that data. And it needs to be shared rapidly and as close to real time as possible. Connecting the shooter with the sensor and enabling the processing of that information. Uh, through this, we can build a platform for data collection and really stage that information to enable future decisions to be augmented with artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms. You know, designers of SOSA aligned systems need to be aware of these programs, directives, and user demands, and as industry partners to the government, uh, ensure that we're ready to meet the challenges. So what does this mean in practice? We can look at some of the objectives presented at the Army uh, Technical Exchange meeting last year in Nashville. Uh, pretty much everything presented here below the end user device is going to need support from the SOSA ecosystem. Our SOSA-based systems will need to support a standardized platform architecture. They need to be configurable to create a transport agnostic virtualized data fabric, and they need to be able to connect to a cloud computing environment. Through all that, we can you know, produce a common operating environment for the users and make it complete with all of the cybersecurity standards required to protect uh, these assets, the data, and the interconnected systems. While this is an Army-focused slide, there are similar goals throughout the Air Force in their, Air For uh, their Advanced Battle Management System, or ABMS, and the Navy's Project Overmatch. Through the rest of my presentation, I'll examine these trends and a few other interesting information system technologies that can be applied to SOSA-based systems. You know, the first trend is a need for a standardized platform architecture. And we can take a snapshot of four very different devices. You know, a rack mount server, a Packstar semi-rugged server, a Curtis Wright Parvis fully rugged server, and then a 3U VPX uh, compute card. While the physicality of these devices is different, the underlying architecture, in this case, Intel x86, really isn't all that different. And that's a good thing. While other platforms such as ARM have their advantages, at least for the foreseeable future, x86 is the lingua franca of compute. And we can take that common platform uh, to look at the next trend, a cloud environment. There was a popular saying about a decade ago that the cloud is just someone else's computer. And that might have been true at the time, but today the cloud encompasses so much more. It's still a central repository with the ability to scale up uh, storage and compute resources as needed, but it doesn't always need to belong to someone else. Really, it's likely a combination or a hybrid of government owned data centers and FedRAP certified third party services. But primarily beyond the hardware, it's a different way of thinking about computing where we decouple the hardware from the processing platform. You know, in this diagram, you can see a virtualized architecture. You've got a hypervisor sitting on top of compute hardware that can act as a proxy and, and run multiple operating systems and op applications on top of that. And those applications can be all kinds of data processing applications, communications systems, or virtualized network functions like firewalls and routers. And what that will do in the SOSA ecosystem is reduce the need for specialized cards. Uh, the payload or IO profiles can really cover a lot of needs and act as a software definable network. Really, it's a micro cloud at the edge, or at least a 2010 style uh, cloud at the edge. Getting to this vision on the SOSA back system would be a great achievement uh, for a common platform for data sharing. Uh, the use of a hypervisor with broad support like VMware ESXi or KVM on Linux or Microsoft Hyper-V allows us to run a wealth of applications and apply them to the warfighter. But this is really just a stepping stone. If we look at what the Army is doing with the software factory they set up in Austin or the U.S. Air Force's Kessel Run Group, they're expecting to make use of modern tools like containers, 
serverless architectures and DevSecOps to develop the information-based tools that our warfighters need. We as industry will be pushed to produce a computing environment that has all of the 2020s cloud goodness on SOSA aligned hardware, even in a disconnected edge environment. It's abundantly clear that the future conflict is in cyberspace and we need to empower tomorrow's warfighters with the cutting edge tools to uh, achieve and maintain overmatch with our adversaries. Whether they're thousands of miles away from the battle in a cyber operation center or on the more traditional battlefield with trucks and tanks and planes. Because disconnected is a fact of life in these denied, degraded, intermittent, or limited network environments. But we need to do as much as we can to keep these warfighters connected. And I think that's where software defined wide area networking technology can help us build more robust communication networks. Again, we are decoupling the network from the hardware and allowing us to bond multiple network connections into one virtual data fabric. Bringing with that the reliability across the multiple unreliable technologies. That will allow us to far exceed the objectives set by things like PACE plans, where a unit or a program defines a primary alternate contingent and emergency transport, but instead we've created a system that automatically writes traffic over the best transport, even as that definition of best is constantly changing. Further, SD-WAN technology brings in the ability to be aware of the application and the user that's being transported. So we can prioritize this data, route it over the best pipe based on need and making sure that our decision makers get the information from the edge quickly and reliably. On this slide, I have got a diagram that outlines one such system that Curtis Wright and Cisco demonstrated last year. On the left, there's a Curtis Wright VPX card representing a SOSA system that would be installed in a Bradley, an OMFV, or a Striker. That card is running Cisco's SD-WAN software powered by their Catalyst 8000V on VMware ESXi. On the right, we have a Packstar 400 series-based system that is representing a command post or maybe a communications vehicle. In that system, there's a 451, also running VMware ESXi and the Cisco Catalyst 8000V. And through that, we have built a SD-WAN application running over multiple transports. You can see the transports in the middle, 4G, 5G, uh, represented by that cradle point. There are man radios, which we were using Sylvis in this case, and then some other wired connections that could be swapped out for things like line of sight um, or fiber or even installed uh, fixed infrastructure wired in the command post. So in this cloud at the top, uh, we have the orchestrator for the system, but one of the nice things about the Cisco software is that we can have multiple orchestrators and locate them in multiple places throughout the network. And that could be at a forward operating base or cloud or a government owned data center. So once we have all of this set up, we're able to degrade those links or disconnect those links and continue to flow traffic between the systems. Uh, we demonstrated this last year. We kept a video stream running uh, across the whole time while yanking cables and uh, adding latency through a WAN emulator. It's hard to you know, watch or read the news today without seeing the cybersecurity challenges and attacks being carried out on a daily basis against our industrial base and critical infrastructure. It doesn't get as much mention, mention excuse me, uh, but I have no doubt that our military forces are subject to an even greater number of attacks. Today, I see a lot of systems, especially in combat vehicles, that aren't taking a very modern approach to cybersecurity. Much like a castle, they assume that the hard outer shell is protecting those assets inside. When in fact, there's a large set of cybersecurity flowdown requirements that should be met. 
And as systems become more interconnected as part of JADC2, those requirements are going to be enforced. Last year, President Biden issued Executive Order 14028 on improving our nation's cybersecurity. There's also FISMA, which is the existing Federal Information Security Modernization Act, and that requires NIST 800-53 compliance for federal information systems. And the definition of federal information systems really encompasses any type of IP network operated by the federal government, employees, or contractors. Uh, 853, uh, if you're struggling to get to sleep at night, it's nearly 500 pages of thrilling cybersecurity guidance. Uh, but it covers things like using encryption that meets FIP standards, uh, requiring state compliance on all devices, uh, documenting patching schemes, uh, monitoring traffic, and, and detecting anomalies. There are additional standards. Um, some systems that are classified as national security systems have to meet even more stringent requirements. You know, the designers and integrators of SOSA aligned systems, you know, we must be prepared to meet these standards or the systems risk getting blocked at the acquisition stage or assuming they make it through that, they may not be able to connect to these government networks. They can't get the ATO or the authorization to operate from the network owner. You know, the final trend called out in the Army TEM slide is that of a common operating environment. It's imperative that our warfighters have the tools that they have trained with at their disposal so they can get to the mission at hand without distraction. One of the ways Curtis Wright is supporting this is through Packstar's IQ Core software. It's quickly becoming the standard for unified network operations. IQ Core acts as a single pane of glass for monitoring, managing, and maintaining communications and cybersecurity systems. And we're continuously adding support for SOSA aligned devices using open protocols and interface standards like HTTPS, SSH, SNMP, and IPMI. Uh, over on the right, you can even see a uh, touchscreen interface that we've developed for gloved hands uh, in vehicles or on the move operations. While not explicitly addressed in the Army TEM slide, another overarching theme is the need for mobility and survivability at the command post. Uh, this quote actually calls recent events, but it was from 2020. So uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But it's clear that modern conflict is tied to the warfighter's ability to be mobile and agile, and a system design must seek to remove any single points of failure for a robust and survivable design. You know, one of the ways I think that we can support the need for rapid deployment and mobility is through the NSA's Commercial Solutions for Classified program. So if you're unfamiliar with CS CSFC, here it is in a nutshell. And even after seven years of working in the ecosystem, I still mumble around the acronym. Uh, instead of relying on proprietary type one encryption with all of the cost and ComSec handling burden that's involved, the NSA allows us to use a layered approach with commercial encryption from at least two different vendors where classified traffic is tunneled in a VPN that is again tunneled in a second VPN. There's quite a bit more to actually implementing one of these CSFC systems, but that's the general idea. What could actually be more important than the transition from type one to commercial encryption is the new network architectures that are possible using CSFC. There are things that you can do with CSFC that just aren't practical, possible, or cost-effective with type one. You know, one example is uh, the secure wireless command post systems that we've deployed with the US Army. With that system, uh, a secure wireless network can be set up in less than 30 minutes versus hours of running cabling. In this case, the US Army uses a wireless bubble based on Wi-Fi, but the solution is extensible and transport agnostic and that could be 4G or 5G as well. What that does is it moves the command post out of the tent into a vehicle that can be moved as needed. That solution can be extended out to additional vehicles, creating a larger vehicle and allowing users to roam between vehicles without reconfiguring their devices and maintaining access 
to that secure network. We also have free future versions of this design at work that will remove the central hub and move to a true mesh network design for the most survivability possible. Since we have this standardized platform architecture based on virtualization, we can port these types of system designs to SOSA aligned systems. And that will allow additional vehicle types, those that are more appropriate for SOSA based systems to participate in that mesh network. Ultimately, the future applications for SOSA conformant systems will revolve around the rapid collection, processing and distribution of data across domains and between the branches of the military and our coalition partners. So thanks for listening. Um, I think we can turn it over to questions now. Thanks very much. Excellent presentation, Dom. Excellent presentation, Duke. Welcome back. Now we're going to get started with our Q&A. Here we go. First question from the audience is for Duke. How's the market and customer and demand for the SOSA products globally? Good question. Is there demand outside the U.S. for, for SOSA-aligned products yet? Um, surprisingly, yes. Yeah. I think um, initially you see it coming from the U.S. That, that's what you would expect. But the supply chain is very global. And um, so you have uh, suppliers uh, working with uh, other countries that are also companies, uh, not U.S.-based company who wants to sell into, uh, into the U.S. is also complying with uh, SOSA standard. And so we see a fair amount of demand globally for it, uh, Israel, Europe, um, obviously all the NATO partner countries and not, uh, not the, other, the other side. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's actually, and and then I guess in absence of having a um, an open standard, that you might as well adopt one that already exists. So um, and and so we, we're seeing that. Yeah, and I and I can speak to this a little bit. Um, I noticed that there are some in the Ministry of Defense. There's some efforts, I think, to do something similar to what SOSA does. There's different acronyms floating around, so I don't want to name one. One of them does rhyme with SOSA, which is interesting. So I have a I have a question here for for Dom. Um, where can I get details on CSFC? And um, that's a good question. Oh, that is a good question, and it's probably a little bit of a foreign topic to, to this audience. Um, like most things these days, you could just Google CSFC, but you really want to go straight to the NSA. Um, so when you look at that, they have um, provided a great detail of information. Um, what it is based on is what they call capabilities packages. And there are a number of capabilities packages and they have uh, example architectures that you can look at and, and download. And, and frankly, um, there is a CSFC uh, show next week in DC. Uh, basically everyone in that ecosystem will be present there, uh, myself included. Um, happening across town for modern day Marine. So pop in if you're in town uh, or give me a call. Okay. You know, I was at, I, I actually, speaking of hosting and moderating, I actually moderated a, a CSFC event before the pandemic. Um, I think Charlie Kawasaki, your colleague, spoke there at that event. But I remember someone from NSA asking a question about other standards bodies that they can align with. Because to make sure that, like you just said, maybe people who watch this might know a lot about SOS but not know about CSFC. Are there any efforts behind the scenes to kind of find commonality between that and, and other similar standards that you know of, Don? Um, I don't know how formal that has gotten thus far. That is actually um, kind of one of the things that I'm tasked with here at, at Curtis Wright is bringing together the expertise that, that Packstar has in applying these system designs to both our modular systems and SOSA, uh, you know, aligned and conformant systems. Um, I know that the CSFC ecosystem has brought in the uh, cross-domain program office to participate. So we're pulling that in together. And then um, I'm looking at, I've just joined the subcommittee for SOSA for uh, security. So I'm looking to see where those things can overlap and hopefully I can make some connections uh, between both ecosystems. You will build that bridge, Dom, we know it. <laughs> so I've got a question here. I think this one came in um, during Duke's presentation, but I could be wrong. They didn't, they didn't actually uh, assign it to one of you. Um, can, the SOSA test suites be hosted in the cloud? 
can the entire process be digital, i.e. end-to-end -end in the cloud? Who would like to grab that one? <laughs> I, I, I honestly have to, to feign ignorance on, on that. I have not uh, actually looked at how they plan to implement these, these testing protocols. Uh, we've got some engineers at, at Curtis Wright that are, are watching that very closely. Duke, have you um, looked at that any closer? Nope. I do know from going to a couple of the um, plug fest and stuff, there, there's mostly it's facilities that are being set up. So I don't know how compatible they will be with the cloud and there's all the security issues and the ITAR stuff that goes into anything related with SOSA. So I think they'll look at that, but it might be challenging from a regular, regulation and verification standpoint on the security side, but we'll see. You don't know what rules the government will come up with to uh, make sure they protect their IP. I think we can all agree on that. Um, another question here, now I'm going to give this one to Duke. What's the difference between being SOSA conformant and SOSA compliant? You touched on it, but I think maybe you could repeat it again because somebody's asking in the audience. Yeah. Uh, one is, uh, well, actually, it's I think it's SOSA aligned and SOSA conformant. Right. There is no SOSA compliance. It doesn't yeah. exist. Um, and uh, one is you design for it, and the other one you know that is designed and tested for it. And then I think what I mentioned in my presentation is one is you know it should work, the other one you know it it will work, and so that that simply it's just a it's just a further a level of fidelity or, uh, uh, that that you can provide to the customer that if it's conformant then it, it it's going to work. But as far as design, you don't you you design for alignment, not necessarily for conformant. I, I suspect conformant is more testing that you you test what you align to properly. And, I, and I've heard someone else answer this question within SOSA up there between the word conformant and compliant. The reason they want to go with conformant is they want to have their conformant se uh, system set up. So you have to go through their process to be conformant and they will determine whether or not you're conformant. And they, and they're, I believe their explanation was that if you're compliant, compliance, you can do yourself. Conformance, you need their system and their rules and their, their approval at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I've heard so far. All right. So um, next question for the audience. So one's for Duke. Anything is there anything we can do to in our products to be sure they are eventually end up SOSA compliant once the compliance system's out there? Uh, the best you can do is to make sure that it's aligned. Uh, aligned and then first. You go well, through, you know, start now, yeah. right? Is what you're yeah. saying. Before yeah. that, don't even a, wait for that. Just get prepared. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't think there's anything per se from a design perspective. Uh, that you can uh, design, design for conformance as opposed to because conformance is the next step of alignment. So it, sh it shouldn't contradict each other. You don't design something for align and then a different set of requirements for conformance. Uh, it's more of a just to make sure that you did what you say you would do uh, properly. Um, so from a design perspective, um, you don't have to do anything special for conformance. It's more you got to make sure that uh, and the aligned part is uh, you, you, you've done the properly. Well, well, and I think you actually touched on it in your, your presentation, right? If we think about design as purely, you know, routing traces on a board, yes, we want that to be aligned. But when we talk about a product design, we need to account for the tasks, time, and cost that is going to be associated with achieving conformance, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, next question for the audience. This one is for Dom. You mentioned the Packstar 400 series a few times. Is that SOSA aligned? No, the Packstar 400 series is not SOSA aligned. Um, I have got one right here. Um, they are a modular open systems approach to building communications systems. Uh, and we see the directive coming down from MOSA, but we believe that, that every program is going to need to choose what hardware is right for, for their application. And certainly in a man carry or person carry application or a communications vehicle or roll on, roll off, I, I'm not sure that a full SOSA system makes sense. Um, nice thing about the 400 series is there's no data backplane. All of the connections are through the front panel. So we can very, very rapidly build systems through standardized building blocks. Yeah, I think of course, it's Curtis Wright has a ton of uh, VPX cards, many of which are, you know, SOSA aligned already, and we will go through conformance uh, with those as that program develops. So your your MOSA products will work with your SOSA products, and that makes me think of 
just so for those of you who don't know, MOSA is not a standard. It is an approach that has been mandated by the Tri Services. And yes, it's another acronym that rhymes with SOSA, but that means nothing. It has nothing to do with it. So it's because they have similar words. So MOSA is a strategy. SOSA is an example of MOSA, as is the future airborne capability environment, which is a software about software APIs and, and reuse uh, for avionics systems. There's host hardware open systems technology, and there's CMOS, and we could go on and on. But MOSA is everywhere, and it's happening, and um, and so that's a really good point that you made that that's not, while it's not SOSA, it is, it is designed with MOSA in, in mind because that's where everything's going. Uh, next question for the audience, from the audience. I have, um, how do you manage IP during the verification process, i.e. a competitor OEM validating another competitor's product for certification? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Well, I mean, that's, that's a good question. Um, I don't think the intent is that you would be going to a direct competitor for your conformance to, or your certification authority. Um, now, certainly you're going to have to work with other integrators. They're going to see your IP, but I don't think that's any different than the ecosystem that, that we're working in today. Yeah. I, I don't feel SOSA changes how you protect the IP normally. I guess. I mean, the fact that you comply to an open standard, um, I think there's is, is only the connection portion of it that is common where you have the same slot or the same something. Uh, whatever you do behind the scene up to that point, it's still your own IP. So I don't see that to be an issue. Okay. Yeah, I, I like to think in, in vehicle analogies, right? So you design a vehicle like a car to fit on our roads and, and maybe you know, Consumer Reports buys one and evaluates it, but you don't concern yourself too much with, with protecting the IP once once it's out of the gate, right? Anyone can get your hardware, and if your, your IP is visible on the outside, then that's a different problem, but your IP that's used to build that, you, know, you should have the same protections you've always had. Okay. I've got a question here uh, for Duke. You mentioned third-party verification authorities. Um, and this is interesting, would that include the ability to be certified in-house, such as Raytheon, BA systems, et cetera? That does not look to be the case right now. Um, I guess uh, if, if you look at the way the FAA is doing, they have a daily delegation of authority where you have internal companies doing that. Uh, but even that, they had a lot of problem with Boeing. Uh, they over abuse that systems uh, where they self-verify themselves. Uh, from what we see is, is you do the internal testing yourself. You have all the documentation you send to a third party. And a third party uh, is a company that has to apply to the open group and to be uh, certified, as I guess, as a third party verification authority. Uh, and it doesn't look like it's a certified in-house. When you don't, you don't self-certify yourself, I guess, if you, if, you, if you apply. If you're Raytheon and you apply to be... VA, I don't think you get to verify yourself. I, that doesn't yeah. seem to be the case right now. Yeah, so certainly, you know, larger groups like like the Raytheons of the world would love to be able to, you know, self-certify uh, to reduce costs and have a better control of, of timelines. But the government influence on, on SOSA is really pushing back against that idea, looking for that independent third party, mm -hmm. really, so that we can you know, trust that stuff is going to be interoperable. Yeah, they definitely want to go from away from that 20th century business model where everything's kind of proprietary within prime contractor systems, and as much as that's frustrating for some at that level. Uh, next question from the audience. I got another one here for Duke. How will SOSA help companies innovate within a standard-based environment where interoperability and commonality seem counterintuitive to technology advancements? Yeah. I guess I touched on that a fair bit in, in, uh, in my presentation, the beginning of it. It's it's by having an open standard, I think you um, you allow the system to upgrade easily um, and that's innovation uh, allows, you, you can do that much easier by having open standards. You Your product development does not limit to only what you have uh, because you can now easier, let's say I partner with Dominic and we do something and you know, uh, then you, you have some some component that works, and then the, the uh, your partner, competitors, whatever, um, 
will have something that that uh, that you don't have, and so it has the ability to do that. Um, so having uh, the SOSA standard allows for much more opportunity to do to to do things, and also opportunity to do a lot faster as well. Um, so I, I see that very much as uh, something that can that will accelerate the uh, development of things. Um, I don't see uh, open standard to be counter to. Uh, I guess in the past, every, every company is more uh, protect their IP and don't want to share and, and things like that. I, I think that business model is is, is changing very rapidly. Uh, we live in a connected world, and uh, you only have a few companies, the the giants that can do many things. Uh, uh, but the majority of it, it's uh, you have to rely on the supply chain. And then when you do that, when you have open standard, it, it's allowed you to do so much more than what you would be able to do otherwise. Okay, thank you. Next question. This one is for Dom. How did the security requirements that you mentioned map to SOSA? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And, and like I think I mentioned uh, in one of the earlier answers, uh, I'm planning to start participating in the SOSA subcommittee on security and, and making sure they're looking at the broader cybersecurity infrastructure and not just, you know, inter, intercard and, and cross domain. Um, so that's something that, that we as an industry need to look at and something that anyone who's interested in, uh, I encourage you guys to reach out to me. Okay. I got another one here for you. Um, if virtualization is 2010's tech, why apply that to SOSA? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, that's a little, a little bit flippant uh, of a comment there for me. Um, and, and it is. There are things that are being done in today's clouds that are beyond virtualization. But I think virtualization is a great intermediate step from, you know, the one card, one function kind of mindset that folks have had in the past to allow you know, one card multifunction. And just like we have standard interfaces uh, in the hardware, there are standard interfaces for virtualization. And then we can swap out those subcomponents at a software level and not be tied to an existing design, be more flexible and not have as many point product cards. Once we get there, we can start looking at evolving and bringing those serverless technologies things like Dev DevSecOps onto the platform first as a virtual machine and then down to the lower layers. And that's really what's happened in, in enterprise and industry over, over the last decade. They didn't just flip a switch one day and it, it happened. It's an evolution. Okay. And Duke, I've got a question here. I think this, I'm gonna turn this one to you because I think it's about uh, what is the timeline for conformance? What's the timeline for these steps? Do we have an idea when? We are guessing later this year. <laughs> well, I do remember at a press conference, this is to the to the the questioner. Um, I did ask that same exact question um, of some folks from SOSA, and when they right after they announced the technical standards, this would have been in October. I think it was in an AUSA press conference, the big Army show, and they said twelve months from October. So that tr I kind of goes with what Duke just said. So hopefully by the end of the year, um, you know, with, I, I once asked uh, Dr. Ilya Lipkin. Um, you know, why this is SOSA been such a hot topic? Why has it got the momentum? He's the person that leads SOSA. He's from the Air Force. And he said, you're always at the mercy of the enthusiasm of your volunteers. Right now, I have a lot of enthusiastic volunteers, but it takes time to move that mountain. So, yeah. um, but there is, there's a lot of enthusiasm behind this, as you guys can see. Um, and so I, I got one more question here that we're going to have to kind of end it. And this one is, um, this is not... Uh, address to anyone so i'll take you guys pick it i'm going to throw it since i just gave out one to duke i'm going to give this one to you dom how much participation have you seen or do you expect from major cloud providers like microsoft amazon and google and so so we have seen the processing companies nvidia and intel join what about the cloud guys well that's that's very that's a that's an interesting question and i i can guarantee you they are paying attention um but i do not know that they will interject themselves at the SOSA level, they may choose to stay one level above that and be the systems that they connect to. You know, we talked about two, two major trends being MOSA and JADC2, and the, the other one is, is cloud compute for, you know, the federal government. There was this massive JEDI contract that didn't really go anywhere, but there's a, a follow-on uh, called JWCC, um, Joint Warfighter Cloud Connection, uh, that 
everyone's kind of anticipating that's going to be uh, more of a menu style award. So individual programs or units will be able to select cloud services from Google or from Amazon or from uh, Microsoft or whoever else ends up participating in that. And there is going to be um, a need to connect these SOSA systems to those clouds. Whether we can do it without direct participation from the cloud providers, I think we can. It might be better if they choose to participate. Okay. Thank you for that. And that brings us right up to our time limit today for the webcast. Sorry, we could not get to all of your questions. So we may get back to you after the event with more information. I want to thank Duke and Dom for speaking today and AI Tech and Curtis Wright Defense Solutions for sponsoring this event. This and all Open Systems Media webcasts are copyrighted and may not be recorded or used in any way but with the express written consent of Open Systems Media. Thank you for attending today's webcast. We look forward to seeing you on future events in the, of ours. And also one more thing, if you're curious and you want to check this session out later, the overall event will be archived online today and be available for one year and there will be an MP3 version of the event available as well. Thanks, we'll see you on the next one.